year after the Maui fires, many survivors are still dealing with trauma. Licensed marriage and family therapist Britt Young is here to talk about the mental health fallout. And, and Britt, you said even one year later, things might even be worse for some of these people. Right. What's really difficult about trauma in general is that it just doesn't go away because time passes, right? And for a significant number of people, the passage of time can make the symptoms even feel worse. And so that's what we're seeing. And especially with the lack of support and closure, you know, I will say Hawaiian News Now has done a great job highlighting some of the people who are struggling. And as I was watching your coverage, I was thinking, you know, for every person who's coming on, there might be 10, 20 or more yeah. who are silently suffering. So you're right. The passage of time does not mean it necessarily gets better. I think we got a long way to go. Yeah. So, so when we talk about these survivors, what are we thinking for them in terms of long term yeah. effects? Well, here we have to mostly rely on the data. So the data say about 30 to 40 percent of survivors of natural disasters will develop diagnosable PTSD. 10 to 20 percent of rescue workers and 5 to 10 percent of the general population. And we're talking about nightmares and flashbacks, hypervigilance, right, survivor's guilt, all of those things. And what's even harder is that there are at-risk populations like women and adolescents, children, those with prior mental health needs. So it feels like we really have a mountain to climb here. And there could be hundreds, if not thousands, of people around the state having these diagnosable symptoms but not maybe getting treatment. Yeah, okay, so what can be done? It's going to be that combination of a lot of things, I think. You know, when we talk yeah. about what can be done, there's always so many. But you know what came to mind interestingly was Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you know what right. that is. It's like right. it's hard to attend to your mental health needs if you are food insecure, shelter insecure, right? We have to have those set before we can attend to our mental health. So that would go a long way, of course, having everyone feel secure in that way. Appropriate treatment would be a dream of mine, of course. And then, you know, the biggest tool, I think, though, the most powerful tool might be this connection piece. What we hear from survivors often is that what they miss most is a sense of connectivity, a sense of community, a sense of collective purpose. And I don't come here with any ideas necessarily yeah. like exactly how to do that, but how can we restore a sense of community and connection for these folks? I tend to believe that would really move the dial and go a really long way. Yeah. It was hard. And, and I, I think for the two of us, we, we don't even begin to pretend to understand what they're going through. But at the same time, maybe drawing awareness to us is kind of helping us see that if we do have the means to, we can help out with the needs that they have and then therefore can kind of kind of help with the exactly. get the ball rolling as far as the healing is concerned, right? That's a great point. You know, anybody who's watching this segment who has the means to support or help some way, somehow, yeah. I was thinking, you know, what would, happen, what would happen if everyone reached out and tried to build a connection with someone who's really struggling over there? Would that move the dial? Uh, possibly. But, yeah, I think all of us have a role to play. Yeah, a call to sure. action. Britt, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right. It's uh, 713 right now. We'll be right back.